so this is everything you ever wanted to know about ophthalmic pathology for OCAPs. And so it's going to be just pattern recognition and looking at pictures and trying to figure out what they are. And we'll try to go over as many as we possibly can in the next hour. So this is about two hours worth of slides, but we'll try to do it all <coughs> in an hour. All right, so first thing, what, you know, what do pathologists do? They try to figure out what happened to dead tissue. So this is the job of pathologists. So what I want to do today is I want to go just start with the lid, work our way in, conch cornea, anterior chamber, lens, retina, optic nerve, and just see what we can do. All right, so first of all, lid. Okay, what are the layers of the lid? Becca. Less than that. Skin. Skin. All right, skin. First layer. What's the second layer? Um, well, it's part of the skin. That's not a real layer. Muscle. Orbicularis muscle. Third layer. What are all those little yellow things right there? That's the tarsus, and what lives in the tarsus? Hypomian glands, exactly. And then finally, the innermost layer? Exactly. So people keep forgetting that there's conge lining the inside of the eyelid. So when we look at them pathologically, skin, stratified squamous keratinized epithelium, epicularis muscle, tarsal plate with sebaceous glands, and the conjunctiva lining the inside. So the lid, you've got to remember the lid has all the glands in it. So it's got eccrine glands, i.e. sweat glands, i.e. Um, lacrimal glands. But it's also got the glands that are apocrine glands, which are the glands of mall, which dump into the hair follicles. And then lastly, we've got polycrine glands, which are the sebaceous glands or the meibomian glands, which look right here. All right, so this is what we do. That's my fellows down in the lab <laughs> in the pathology. All right, so we're looking right here. Reese, what are we seeing here? Okay, so when you're looking at things on, on boards or OCAPs, you want to start thinking of differential diagnoses. And so this is a Shalazin indeed, but you want to start thinking what else could this be? It's kind of a swollen red bump of the eyelid. So what's your differential diagnosis? <laughs> Exactly, or even something infectious like, you know, proteolums or things like that, chalazion, anything that can cause cysts. And then we look at the inside and we see that there's, it's coming over into the inside here. So that would be more consistent with a chalazion, exactly. And what is the path of a chalazion? Exactly. So here we see a giant cell. So it's granulomous inflammation, but there are also multiple uh, lymphocytes and multiple plasma cells here. And so, but it's a, it's a granulomatous inflammation. It's due to inspissated lipid. So all these empty spaces here are where lipid was that dissolved as part of a process. So this is the original Olympic Stadium in Athens, not original, but modern original Olympic Stadium in Athens, 1896. All right, so we're looking at lid tumors. Lee, what are you seeing right here? Looks like crusted lesion uh, that's ulcerated um, in the lower lid. Um, and because it's in the lower lid, there's several types of potential tumors. Maybe so, maybe more. Um, and also in the swing cell at some point. Well, especially when you see an ulcerated lesion with raised pearly borders, you really want to think basal cell. And then what's the characteristic path findings on a basal cell? Palisading. So you see lining up, palisading of the nuclei, basophilic staining nuclei there, and palisading at the edge of them. Now, what's the most common um, type of basal cell carcinoma? Is it nodular? Nodular or nodular cystic? 
And so you can see right here, you've got these large nodules. If you look real closely, there is palisading here at the edge, and some of them form a little cyst. What is the one type of basal cell we worry about? Sclerosing or morpheiform is the other word that you may want to know about this. And so the problem with these is these tend to not be solid nodules. These tend to send fingers out or they can spread in a pagetory pattern, meaning they can spread kind of under the epithelium. And you see that there's multiple little fingers of tumor cells, but surrounded by <coughs> connective tissue. So we call this morpheiform or sclerosing type basal cell carcinoma. And this is what happens if you don't treat a basal cell. They don't grow for 10 years. So even though they're benign and they don't metastasize, they can cause tremendous local damage. All right, what are we seeing right here, Chris? So, uh, uh, thermos raised lesion of the eyelid, uh, loss of eyelashes. Um, could be a malignancy as well, especially with loss of eyelashes. Maybe spring cell or another basal cell. All right, so when you look at that little, we call it this parchment paper look. Kind of that, looks like a little parchment paper, and it's got kind of that orangish hue to it because it's got a lot of keratin in there. This is a squamous cell. And what is this that we see that characterizes squamous cell carcinomas? Keratin pearls. So here are the keratin whorls or keratin pearls. And you see that the squamous cells are not dark basal folk stain like the basal cells. They're more an eosinophil stain. They stay more pink. But the tip off is, is when you start to see these keratin pearls, you think about a squamous cell. Tara, what are we seeing here? So it's the lesion of the upper eyelid and it's um, being late pigmented, and there's also loss of eyelashes. Okay, so there's loss of lashes. You see it's irregular, and it's got different shades of pigment, brown and black. What would you be concerned about here? Melanoma. All right. So you'd be concerned about melanoma. Indeed, this is a melanoma now. Um, they may show you pictures of nevi, and so, you know, when you see that distinct nesting pattern, you, know, you think more nevi, but when you see cells that have those nucleoli and the chromatin, then you start thinking of melanoma. Ashley, what are we seeing here? Um, this is a So they call sebaceous the great mimicker. And so you always want to keep that in the back of your mind. If you see a, what's called a blepharoconjunctivitis, that's you know, not going away or not getting better, and you look carefully, you see that the margin is thickened. You know, these little yellow areas showing through, and there's loss of lashes. So this just isn't, isn't just a blepharoconjunctivitis. This is indeed a sebaceous gland carcinoma. And so if you've got recurrent chalasia, that's the other one. So you've got chalasia keeps recurring in the same place. You want to look at the pathology because you worry about sebaceous gland carcinoma. <clears throat> and when you look at the pathology of sebaceous gland carcinoma, they tend to be very active looking. So these can be nasty tumors. These can metastasize. And if you look at them, they look nasty. All right, so then we've got our, just to keep you guys awake. All right, conjunctiva. So Becca, what are the three kind of parts of the conjunctiva? We, we talked about one. Palpebral, so that's the part that lines the eyelid. Okay. Bulbar. Bulbar, and then what's in between? Fornix. The fornix, or the fornicial conjunctiva. And if you look right here, you see it's got that stratified squamous epithelium, just like skin, but it's not keratinized, and so it's a mucous membrane. And these little dots you're seeing in here are all little goblet cells. They're the ones that make mucin. So the further you get from the limbus, either toward the fornix or toward the caruncle, the more goblet cells that you see. All right, Reese, what are we seeing here? Mm -hmm. So elevated... Uh, are, is there other Reese's here? Uh, <laughs> 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 Pick up, God! <laughs> so it's kind of like a sail-shaped area elevation on the temporal conjunctiva. So what do you think that is? Uh, yeah, or in this case, it's not quite across the limbus, so a penguicula. 
Exactly. And so the difference between a pterygium and a pigwecula? Exactly. So the same pathology, it's just the pterygium has crossed the limbus and gone onto the surface of the cornea. What's the classic path that we see? Uh, you get the thing of the of the epithelium, uh, basal degeneration, so so this is that smudgy blue basophilic degeneration. You get that squiggly solar elastosis. So it's a UV-induced degeneration of the subepithelial tissues. You can even get little flecks of calcium forming in here. This is that classic basophilic degeneration of collagen that you see in a pterygium. All right, Lee, what do you see in here that doesn't quite look like a pterygium? No, there's this gelatinous uh, overgrowth. So what would you be concerned about here? My biggest concern would be uh, this Okay. And then in this particular case, we look at the pathology, and indeed there's all this dysplastic epithelium, loss of maturation, even some wisps of keratin on the surface, but this membrane still looks intact. So what would you call this? CIN. CIN, or conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. So when we grade CIN, how do we grade it? Um, mild, moderate, severe. Exactly. And we start at the basilar layer. So if it involves kind of the lower third, we call it mild. Middle third, we call it moderate. Greater than middle third, we call it severe. But it's still intraepithelial, and that's the key thing. It has not gone beyond the epithelial basement membrane. Okay. What do we see on right here, Chris? So it looks like an inflamed conjunctiva, temporal conjunctiva. Uh, sort of has the look of a, uh, a pterygium or people like to but it just looks a lot more inflamed than you don't think so be worried about. Some sort of neoplasia as well here. What is this white stuff here? Uh, I'm not sure. Is this for easy day or just a... I'm not sure. It's actually part of the lesion. It's not exudate. Is that keratin? It's keratin. And so what do we call this when it's this white keratinized lesion? Uh, keratinized neoplasia. No, no, it comes from the Greek, of course. We call it gluco, white, plachia, plaque, white plaque, glucoplachia. So this is a tip off that you've got keratin on here. And when you've got a big plaque of keratin, you're, you know, your differential is always, is it CIN, is it squamous cell, and when you look, it's actually invaded below the basement membrane in the substantia propria, and again, you see these whorls and pearls, and it can form keratin, even though the conjunctival epithelium is not keratinized, and so this is squamous cell carcinoma of the conj now. All right, we're looking right here, Tara. Um, so it looks like there's some um, area Anything worrisome there? Okay. So nothing worrisome. What, do, what does PAM stand for? Primary acquired melanosis. Exactly. So this is indeed primary acquired melanosis. And when we look at primary acquired melanosis, we subdivide it into PAM without atypia and PAM with atypia. So this would be PAM. Without atypia. So you see that there are benign melanocytes just in the basilar layer of the epithelium. And so this is the PAM without atypia. This is what racial pigment looks like also. But sometimes you can get a lesion that looks like this. Is this more suspicious? Uh, yes. Exactly. So feeder vessels, and it's thickened, and it's darkened. And so this has now become. PAM with atypia, but remember, PAM is intraepithelial, just like CIN, and so by definition, the basement membrane is still intact, but look at these bizarre melanocytes. They're invading up into the epithelium, they've got nucleoli, they've got chromatin, so this is PAM with atypia, and this is important because this is a precursor to, to what? Oh, to melanoma. Melanoma. 
Exactly. So that's what can happen if you don't take care of PAM is it can become malignant melanoma. So PAM is the most common precursor to malignant melanoma. So you look at malignant melanoma, 80% of them arise from pre-existing PAM. So it's important that you remember that. All right, so there's the Parthenon on top of the Acropolis. They've been rebuilding for about 100 years, but they're, they're getting there. They keep getting money from the Germans. They'll eventually finish it, so. So can I just show you a path photo of, like, of PAM? Is it, I feel like I, I would have a hard time saying that that's. Ho hopefully they would show you either melanocytes in there or they'd show you a clinical picture because these just look like big malignant cells. And yeah, you can't okay. tell that they're melanocytes or not. Okay. And that's what makes it tough because sometimes they start to lose their pigment. Right. And you don't see them. You expect melanocytes to have lots of pigment, but sometimes not. All right, so we're going to talk about the cornea here. Actually, what are the layers of the cornea? So we'll give Becca a break from naming layers here. <laughs> um, okay, so you would have the epithelium, um, these kind of membrane bones, uh, and then the stroma, and the and the epithelium. All right, very good. And so when we're looking right here, it's important to remember Bowman's is not the basement membrane of the epithelium. So you've got a basement membrane right here. That's a basement membrane. Bowman's is some condensed stroma. So Bowman's is important because it does not regenerate. So if you get an injury or an ulcer or something in that area, Bowman's won't regenerate. Now posteriorly, how do we tell? What's the stain we can do to tell decimase from Bowman's? Yes. Yeah, yes. Why? It or, is. Or it's what kind of tissue? Collagen. Mm, nope. Basement membranes. Oh. Yeah. So PAS stains basement membranes. And remember, decimase is a basement membrane of the endothelium, where Bowman's is not a basement membrane. So here's something we never see in the path lab. That's called an endothelium. So that's what endothelium should look like. So you guys never see that because we always get damaged tissue. All right, so this is what I love when I'm sitting there on Sunday morning eating my little bowl of Wheaties, watching the Eye Institute commercials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so corneal infections. Becca, what, what is this pattern <coughs> right here? <coughs> A dendrite. And what kind of stain have we used to show this? Uh, fluorescein. Fluorescein. So what classically gives you a dendrite up there? What kind of herpes? Simplex. Simplex. But... You always have to add the butt. Could be zoster, but usually it's more herpes, but it could be zoster. So this is simplex. Classic epithelial dendrite. So you get loss of epithelium in that area. You get some denuded epithelium here. And you get an inflammatory cell reaction. OK, what are we seeing right here, Reese? Um, so there's kind of injection, uh, chemosome, and whitening. Whitening, it looks like probably some bit of the corneas. All right, and so at this point, you look at it, and this is the path you see. Um, yeah, so it looks like it might be perforated, but there's just a dramatic number of uh, inflammatory cells from the corneal stroma and then loss of the corneal epithelium. All right, so this is more consistent with a bacterial corneal ulcer. And On the last slide, so it was, I meant to ask, so with pseudogenerate, what's the other one that gives you a pseudogenerate metabolic disorder? Is it cystinosis? No right. idea. Sorry. One of the metabolic disorders can give you pseudodendrites. That's that's information I've completely purged from my neurons. <laughs> so, unfortunately, your neurons don't keep growing when you get older, and, and you can't add memory, so you just have to start like purging, dumping stuff you don't need. So if you ask me anything about the sphingomyelinoses, look it up. Because so, I'm grandfather. I don't have to take boards anymore. So I don't have to know that. So Lee, we're looking at this lesion. Now, this is kind of similar to the previous one, but there's some subtle differences. So um, again, it looks like there's an inflamed uh, kind of conductiva. Um, but then when you look at the cornea, it looks like there's more of a uh, deeper, um, more nonlinear look to the, uh, the, the changes. It looks like it's the diffuse haze. Kind of see that diffuse haze around it and this little numular area. What would you be concerned about here? Um, more of an interstitial uh, keratitis. Um, 
What infectious could cause this? Uh, so uh, HSV can cause that, um, but also syphilis can cause that. How about this? That can cause that too. All right, so what are these? Exactly. So as we call them, yeasty beasties. Now don't say that on uh, boards again. <laughs> Board examiner is going to go what? So this is a, a stain that stains for fungi. So remember, fungal ulcers can be more indolent. They can have that little halo of the infiltrate around them. And what's the stain we use for fungal ulcers? Uh, GMS. GMS. And so the way you remember that is gamorium methanamine silver, and it stains the the fungal elements silvery black. So that's a fungal stain. And then, uh, Chris, what are we seeing here? Looks like another big corneal ulcer, really infiltrated, really stupid looking, uh, ulcer pseudomonas. Well, if you look right here, that's actually not an ulcer. That's just a chronic epithelial okay. defect. Mm -hmm. So you've got a chronic epithelial defect, and there's one more thing on here that can give you a hint as to what this is. Is it just being like this function? God, all these years I've been showing this picture, I've never noticed that there's my bone being on here. That's, that's good. That is absolutely correct. And that has nothing to do with the diagnosis, but that is correct. Uh, it looks like there's maybe thinning as well in the cornea, but it's hard for me to tell. I'm not sure. What is this right here? I guess a ring of some sort. Yeah, there's kind of an immune ring. So this was treated as a chronic herpes and this non-healing epithelial defect, very painful, immune ring around it. I know this should all be you know, fireworks in my head. But... Okay, does that help? Yes, that looks like uh, amoebas. Exactly, so this is a classic acanth amoeba picture. Chronic, non-healing ulcer, thought to be herpes but not, and then this ring infiltrate. And then the pain as, as these acanth amoeba cysts uh, trophozoites tend to grow into the nerves, and so this is a classic acanth amoeba. So, you know, whenever they give you a little history, yeah, someone was in a hot tub or something like that, you know, soil exposure, then you start to think of things like acanth amoeba. So if you're ever in a hot tub, don't put your face in it. Right? These kids love living in hot tubs, so just keep it up to the chin, that's all. All right, so here again, some optometric humor here. Dr. Sir, I can't do. I forget the name of this stain that you showed us. Oh, it's a gridley stain. Gridley. But you can also do. They can do amino. They can do fluorescence. <coughs> do the stuff fluoresces. Okay. So you can do a fluorescent microscope and fluorescent. We like to do the gridley stain. Okay. All right. So corneal dystrophies. Now I don't have time to show them all to you in an hour. But uh, Tara, what's the mnemonic that we need to know for cornea stromal dystrophies? gets her man in L.A. County. All right, so if you can memorize that, there's always, every year, one of the corneal stromal dystrophies, always, and that helps you to remember it. So, Maryland, M. Ashley, what does M stand for? That's the second M. What's the first M? Uh, macular. Macular. So macular, mucopolysaccharide, what does the R stand for? Uh, Recessive. So the others are dominant. So macular, mucopolysaccharide, recessive, always. Um, Alshin blue. Okay, Becca gets. Okay, he's gets. Granula, her. Highland, man. Masons. Masons, trichrome. L. A. County, Congo Red. Okay, so if you remember that mnemonic, you'll get at least one question right on, on boards. One. All right, and here's just one of the stains. This is the trichrome stain, just showing you that. All right, uh, Chris, kind of a weird retroillumination of the cornea. What am I trying to show here? So, I'm trying to show us the dystrophy of the stroma, probably. Uh, Hard to tell. Yeah, hard to tell on this, but when you do a retroillumination, that really highlights kind of the posterior corneas. This is 
It's kind of a, a view of posterior. What do we see in here? So uh, an area that is not quite as translucent as the rest of the surrounding cornea. So this is granular cornea. Uh, if, you, if you look at the hinge, you see there's little bumps all over the place. It looks like someone took a little round hammer and just hammered it. Bam, 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 bam. You look at the path and you see these guys. Are these guys right here. Areas of degeneration, little cystic spaces. All right, that's actually normal stroma. We're looking back here. What layer is that? Uh, that looks like um, decimase. Decimase, and that is massively thickened. That's like four times normal thickness. What are these guys back here? Tata. Gutata. So that's what you were seeing on that. So this is Fuchs dystrophy. So Gutata, Fuchs, Fuchs dystrophy. And so what you see is when you look, these are actually little tiny Gutata. You can see them well on retroillumination of the cornea. And they're characterized by these excrescences of these affected endothelial cells on decimase membrane. But then decimase membrane gets markedly thickened. Tara, what are we showing right here? Munson sign, and what is this characteristic of? Keratoconus. Keratoconus. So nowadays, it's pretty rare that we see keratoconus this bad. So this is like a 30-year-old slide. But if you look right here, you can literally see the cone shape of that cornea. This was before we had topographers. And so you have to kind of look and say, is that cornea thin? Is it pooching out? Now with topography, you can tell really well. What is the pathology of keratoconus? That's the end stage. What's the, what's the most common pathologic finding? Um, just maybe just a stroma. Okay, so the stroma does thin, as does the epithelium, but the key is right here in uh, Bowman's layer, you get these focal discontinuities or breaks or squiggles, and some people would even argue that keratoconus is an anterior, like Bowman's layer dystrophy. So you get these discontinuities here in Bowman's layer, and then thinning stroma, thinning epithelium. Notice the endothelium is still pretty good, unless you get a, a massive break in decimase, which is what causes high drops. All right, what are we looking at right here, Ashley? Uh, so, it's like Okay, so this is a big bullet. What stain is this? Short term memory. Yeah. Exactly. It's not a PAS. It is a PAS. Now, note though, this is why I showed you this. Look, here's the basement membrane of the epithelium, PAS positive. Here's Bowman's, not PAS positive. So that shows you the difference. I know the Iron Curtain descends across there. So this is my favorite one. Bardish described the 12 requisites for an oculist and a surgeon. This was in the 16th century. And some of them I, I love is that he said not to be greedy for money or haughty, not to be a drunkard, not to be presumptuous or vainglorious. I love that. Have to be nimble with the hands, be able to draw, to be married, uh -huh. and to have fine, settled, healthy hands. And so those were all the... I love that. And so I love him, too, because this is Barter's too. He said, since I could not afford a high school and university education, I had to restrict myself to surgery. <laughs> I love that comment. Okay. Becca, what part of the eye are we looking at right here? That looks like the angle. All right. So this is the angle. Here's the trabecular meshwork. And what are the different parts of the trabecular meshwork? So if you're looking in with a goniometer, and you see those little lines. What do you see? So, like, starting from anterior to posterior. I'm going to make you compulsive <laughs> before you leave here. So, starting anterior, you're looking in with the gonium here. Starting anterior. Well, anteriorly is actually the the end of bone of decimase membrane. It's called Schwabi's line. And then you see a non-pigmented meshwork, then you see a pigmented meshwork, then you see the scleral spur coming underneath it, and you see the iris root. 
All right, so these are the different kinds of angles you want to look at and always think about. Now, every once in a while, they'll put pictures on no caps, and there'll be a series of them, and I hate these because they'll show you like five different pictures, and then there'll be questions, you know, relating to each one. And one year, they just put in a bunch of gonio pictures. You know, one was a closed angle, one was an open angle, one had some vessels in it, one I have no clue what it had, and so they'll often show you these, and so you want to know where your landmarks are when you look inside there. All right, Reese, what are we seeing here? Um, on the right, there's some kind of an injection and kind of a mid-dilated pupil. Um, the too. All right, so you look in with the slip beam and you see this. Iris on the Exactly, so that iris bowing forward. So that's a narrow angle, relative pupillary block, and this is what can lead to angle closure glaucoma. Now, what's going on here, Lee? This is something a little different. Exactly. And what does PAS stand for? So peripheral anterior sinica, the peripheral iris is stuck to the cornea, and that can happen from chronic angle closure, but also there's some fine little vessels along the surface of the cornea. So this is PAS secondary to neovascularization. Okay, so glaucoma. We're going to look at glaucoma. What are we seeing here, Chris? This with uh, periapapular atrophy. Exactly. So markedly cupped. That's like a 0.9, you know, five cup. So markedly cupped disc. This is a a one disc. In fact, you can even say more than one because these actually excavate like a bean pot. So you look at this. This is an end stage glaucoma, posterior bowing of the lamina cribrosa. You can see the vessels dip along the rim there, and it actually widens out like a bean pot. So that's end stage glaucoma, so you want to worry about that. These are the maidens of the temple on top of the Acropolis. All right, so we're going to look at the crystalline lens. And uh, Tara, what are the different parts of the crystalline lens? Uh, there's the cortex, the nucleus, and the Okay, so nucleus, cortex, lens capsule. And remember, there's lens epithelial cells under the anterior capsule. They go to the equator. There should not be any posteriorly. So that's abnormal if there is. Um, Ashley, what are we seeing here? Uh, so we're seeing the location of the lens super temporally. Okay, so what entity do you worry about there? Uh, Marfan. Marfan. So here's the patient. So if for some reason, Marfan's you get superior temple. That doesn't make sense to me because if zonions are weak, you think it would sink down. But in Marfan's, it goes up and out, homocystinuria down and in. You can also get weak zonules in spherophagia, but there it's different because there the lens is small and round, and then it can dislocate anteriorly. So know your dislocations. All right, so cataracts, various different types of cataracts. Again, know your types of cataract, nuclear cortical, PSC and focal types of cataract. Of course, this is your ultimate nuclear cataract. This is a brunescent or brown-like nucleus. And there's a cortical cataract from behind. All right, so this is my uh, plea for you guys when we do surgery. Remember, the patient hears everything. So we never say, oops. We don't say, oh, shoot. We don't do that. OK, and there's the um, Acropolis at night. All right, now I've got to go to another talk here. I'm going to blitz through these really quick. Okay, any questions on the first part so far? The, the, when you just were talking about the chordal dystrophies, was that macula, the picture you showed, or what kind of dystrophy was that? It was actually a lattice. It was lattice? Yeah, because the lattice looks like a little lattice line, and so it's well named. Think of the lattice like the fence that your rose bushes grow on. You know, so that's a lattice. All right, so now we're going to talk about the retina. So remember, different parts of the retina. To a retina person, the, um, the macula is the area within the arcades. To a pathologist, the macula is the area where the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer is more than one layer thick. So that's the, the the view of the uh, pathologist. Okay, so know your layers. So let's go through the layers real quick from vitreous to choroid, becca, innermost layer of the retina. 
even in front of that. Exactly. So the inner limiting membrane, nerve fiber layer, Reese. Okay, Lee. Okay, Chris. Outer ganglion layer. That's a, that's a new one. I think there was an outer ganglion layer. Okay. Publishing soon. It's going to be the inner nuclear layer. Inner nuclear layer, exactly. Tara. Uh, outer plexiform layer. The uh, outer nuclear layer. Outer nuclear layer. Uh, Becca, what are these right Rods here? And Rods and cones. Very good. And then you get your RPE. Brooks membrane, remember the layers of Brooks, Cori capillaris, and Cori. And of course, here's our fovea, center part of the fovea, where you get um, parting of the, of the cells there. What do we call the area, Reese, where the, the cells here in the fovea send fibers over here in an oblique direction? You mean like the Henley's layer? Henley's layer, exactly. And that's important because cystoid macular edema occurs out here in Henley's layer. All right, so retinal vascular disease. Lee, what are we seeing right here? Um, it looks like, um, it's, like just name the disease. Well, you could, you could do both, but name the findings here. Okay, so there are um, heart exudates, there's uh, cockroach spots, there are flame hemorrhages, there are intraretinal. Okay. So what could this be? This could be hypertensive right now, okay. or it could be diabetic. Exactly. So this could be pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But don't forget hypertensive. Hypertensive can look like this too. And, and believe it or not, I just missed one last year on one of these. I missed the hypertensive. So, okay. So when we look at diabetic retinopathy, what's the first thing that happens here, uh, Chris? With uh, diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic. Uh huh. So you start to get blood vessel weakening from the high glucose load and weakening of the blood vessel walls. So what do we call these little lap pouchings? Microaneurysms. Microaneurysms. The first thing you get is you get microaneurysms. Tara, what are we seeing here? Uh, exactly. So you can get hard exudate, especially in the macula. Here's the dot blot hemorrhages, here's the flame hemorrhages, but you can get hard exudate. And here's a picture of exudate into the retina, so leakage of kind of that serum, if you will, kind of proteinaceous, lipid-rich material. Stop that. Quit yawning. You make me do it. Um, what are we seeing right here, Ashley? Uh, cotton wool spots. Cotton wool spots. And what are cotton wool spots? Uh, infarctions of the nerve fiber layer. Exactly. So they're superficial, little ischemic infarctions of the nerve fiber layer of ganglion cells. So here you see some swollen ganglion cells, swollen nerve fiber layer. And these can come and go. So they're just a sign that you're starting to go from background to what we call pre-proliferative retinopathy. You're starting to get significant ischemia. Becca, what are we seeing here? Um, and where is it located? At the disc. So when we, we subdivide neovascularization into neo of the disc and neo elsewhere. Neo of the disc is important because these can really bleed and they can cause problems. So you've got this classic we call it Medusa, you know, from mythology with the snakes coming out of her head. It looks like a Medusa's nerve there. And what can happen if we don't treat those? And this is even, like, we call it pre-retinal. So it's kind of under the internal limiting membrane. You get this classic boat shape. So that's what we want to prevent, is we want to make that neo go away before we get that boat shape hemorrhage. And this is what happens if we don't. You get scarring, biliosis, chronic hemorrhage, and you can get traction retinal detachments. And so proliferative diabetic retinopathy is something we really need to treat. Now, we used to take a laser and blast the whole peripheral retina, but now people are looking more at doing uh, anti-VEGF injections, either in addition or in place of. And so that may change here in the near future. But for OCAPS, for all you guys, OCAPS is the knowledge that was commonly known about three years ago. So there's nothing new on there. So if you ever come to a question, you go, oh, shoot. You know, Dr. Hartnett says we should do this. Don't go with that answer. Go with the answer that was in the book three years ago. Okay. All right, and here we go. Again, we always wish to do that. Say, oh, you're blind. So there's Dr. Hoops, you know, doing his, doing his LASIK there. 
All right, and so other things that can cause findings that almost look like diabetic retinopathy. Reese, what is this? Oh, this is what hypertensive. It's hypertensive, and you see there's even a little bit of all the changes you see from diabetes, but there's some fuzziness of the disc. And in fact, hypertensive retinopathy, you can get elevation, fuzziness of the disc, you can get this classic star shaped exudate. It's almost like cystoid macular edema with the flower petals, except it's exudate. And so when you get macular heart exudate, you get this star-shaped pattern. And this is a um, severe hypertensive retinopathy. And if you don't treat it, you can destroy an entire retina from damage from hypertensive retinopathy. Lee, what are we seeing here? Um, it looks like... Um, this is uh, a retinal thing. Yeah, so this is blood and thunder retina. And so this is a central retinal vein occlusion. You see backup of blood everywhere. It goes all the way from the disc out to the aura serrata. And so it's like you have a massive wreck on the freeway and the whole freeway is backed up. And so this is a central retinal vein occlusion. And you can get damage mostly to the innermost layers of the retina because remember the inner two thirds of the retina gets its blood from the central retinal artery the outer third gets its blood supply from the choroid. So when you look at a, a damaged retina from a central vein occlusion, the outer third is still normal, still functional. All right, what are we seeing right here, Chris? This looks like a uh, branched uh, retinal artery occlusion. Exactly, so you see the whitening from ischemia. It's kind of opposite of the, the red from a vein. So ischemic area, and this one is in one particular area here where the arterial splits and so this is a branch artery occlusion. What is this? Central artery occlusion. Central artery occlusion. And why do we see that cherry red spot in the center? Because the phobia gets into blood, uh, it's blood supply from the choroid. Well, and that's actually almost like it's a window into the choroid. And so remember when we showed you that picture of the fovea, the superficial retina kind of splits off like wind blowing through a wheat field. And so you're actually looking down in that foveal depression into normal choroidal blood supply. So this is where you see diffuse ischemia, central retinal artery occlusion. And Tara, what are we showing here and why is this pertinent? Um, this is the central retinal artery again. Okay. And what do we see in the central retinal artery? Yeah, you see a severe arterial sclerotic plaque here. So this is all those crown burgers and moochies and all that saturated fat building up in here. It's narrowed the artery, so this is very susceptible to tiny emboli. But also this sclerotic artery shares a sheath with the central retinal vein as it comes into the eye. And so it'll push over on the vein and cause stasis. So the most common cause of Central retinal artery occlusion is arterial sclerosis. Most common cause of central retinal vein occlusion is arterial sclerosis. So you see that that fat artery pushes on the vein and causes some stasis. And again, here's a central retinal artery occlusion, wipes out the inner two thirds, outer third is still intact. The branch retinal vein occlusion is not associated with the Correct. All right, this is the Greek parliament. This is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. This is the Evzon who guards the Unknown Soldier. And, okay, I can't make this up. There are two criteria, well actually three criteria to be an Evzon. You have to be male, first of all, so very discriminatory. You have to be over six foot tall, and you have to be handsome. So short, ugly, you know, women, forget it. You're not allowed in there, man. You have to be a tall, handsome guy. And, and I add one other thing to this, and you have to be very secure in your masculinity because you're wearing white tights, a skirt, and pom-poms on your shoes, so very secure. But these guys are amazing. I sat there for like five minutes and looked at him, and this guy did not blink. I mean, it was amazing. They just sit there, they freeze, and they stand there. They don't even blink for like an hour that they sit there. Okay, so what are we seeing right here? Um, where did I end up? Oh, sorry, Ashley. Uh, this is uh, Drusen. 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 So you see the Drusen, the yellowish white deposits underlying the retinal pigment epithelium. And, and this is a Drusen pathologically. It's this deposit. Technically, it's intra Brooks. 
because it's under the basement membrane of the RPE cell. So it's under the RPE, here's the RPE, and you see these focal areas of drusen. What do we see in here, actually? So this is uh, subretinal and the retinal Exactly. So this, this hemorrhage, because it's that greenish gray color, is actually under the RPE. And then if it's broken through the RPE to come under the retina, it has more of a reddish color. So this is what we want to prevent now in macular degeneration, is we want to prevent these subretinal hemorrhages because if we, and here it is on a fluorescein, you can see the leakage there. Because if we don't prevent them, you can actually get subretinal gliosis, what we call a discoform scar. That can really cause loss of central vision. All right, so retinitis pigmentosa. Becca, what are the classic findings of retinitis pigmentosa? There's three. Hush. And they're all right here. What do you make of that optic disc? Well, it's hard to see because it's really pale. It's white. It's got waxy pallor. What do you make of the little arterioles? Yeah, very attenuated. That's the second one. And what are we seeing out here? Yeah, the, the so-called bony spicule pigment changes. And so when you look at a peripheral part of retinitis pigmentosa, you get this RPE totally disrupted and you get this bony spicule pattern here. And the reason for that is the pigment, for some reason, as it's liberated from the RPE, will settle along the vessels in the retina. So as the retina degenerates, that pigment settles along the vessels, and that's what gives you that bony spicule look when you see that. So you're going to probably have to know the genetics of retinitis pigmentosa, which is basically everything. It can be dominant, it can be recessive, it can even be X-linked, and so all kinds of retinitis pigmentosa-like diseases, too, that they may throw at you. So know those. All right, so this is my favorite in the clinic. I love this guy who draws, who draws these, the, the lady with the white eyes. He did the one about the doctor talking about how he cut himself shaving, too. It's the same picture. <laughs> All right. So, retinal detachments. Um, Reese, what are the different kinds of retinal detachments? Uh, Regmatogenous. And what does regmatogenous mean? Uh, there's a break in the retina. Exactly. So there's a break in the retina, and it's caused, caused by a tear. And then the other type you can get? Exudative. Exudative. So here it's hard to tell, because you kind of see this. I don't know if this is exudative or not, but if we look at this, this is regmatogenous. So you see the classic horseshoe tear, and usually it implies there's some kind of traction in the vitreous pulling on it. You get that classic horseshoe tear in the retina. And so what happens when you get a total retinal detachment? What shape is it? A funnel. Funnel. So you've got attachments at the aura serrata, attachment of the optic nerve, and then you get this total funnel-shaped attachment when the retina detaches completely. And that's what it looks like pathologically. You get this exudate underneath it, and then you can even get proliferation of gliotic cells. We call this condition Lee. What? PVR. PVR. Proliferative vitreal retinopathy. And this is why most retinal detachment surgeries fail is because you get this PVR growing in there. And that's why they fail. So there's Delphi, that's where the oracle sat. All right, so the optic nerve, we're gonna look just a couple of different lesions of the optic nerve. Now this is the optic nerve with the trichrome stain again, showing you the columns with the PL septa in between the subarachnoid, and then lastly there's an optic nerve sheath outside of that. Optic nerve sheath, arachnoid, subarachnoid, pia, central retinal artery and vein. All right, so papilledema. Chris, very important. What is the definition of papilledema? Bilateral optic nerve swelling from the increase in intracranial pressure. Exactly. So don't use the term papilledema. They'll try to trick you, especially when you take oral boards. They'll say, oh, you'll say papilledema. They say, oh, really? So if you just see unilateral disc swelling, you say disc swelling. You don't say papilledema because, again, papilledema means a specific thing. But when you look here, you see that the disc margins are irregular. The veins are sausage-shaped. There's little flame hemorrhages. And so that's classic papilledema. And here's the swollen nerve, surface hemorrhages, dilated vessels, swelling of the nerve. 
So I love in the movies there's always like this, this gallery where people are watching people operate. I've never seen one of those. Have you ever seen one in a hospital? I had, in Houston, they had it, it as like a second floor up and you can look straight down huh? on the operating table. I, I saw one of these in the Moscow. The, the Fyodorov Institute has one of these, but I've never seen one in the U.S. But on TV, they always have the sitting up there discussing, you know, something and all the pieces going on. Never seen it. All right, so we're looking at an optic nerve now. Uh, Tara, what are we seeing here? Yeah, so that's the opposite of papillodema. This would be... End-stage glaucoma, exactly, so different than papilledema. So we're getting close to the lectures that we just had the last couple of weeks. Ashley, what are we seeing here? So I'm seeing one-sided ptosis uh, and uh, right. And even and proptosis. Like, Look how I feel, it's proptotic. And there's the scan. It looks like a fusiform enlargement of the nerve. And what is that characteristic of? A glioma, the optic nerve, and here's that classic fusiform enlargement because it's intrinsic to the nerve itself. And what are these? Rosenthal fibers. Rosenthal fibers. So there's little eosinophilic staining, degenerative, you know, deposits sitting here in the stroma. So remember, optic nerve gliomas are low grade, grade one, astrocytoma, very low grade, or people may call these juvenile pilocytic astrocytomas, pilocytic meaning hair like. And so these are the, the most common optic nerve tumors that you see in kids. Um, what do we see in here, Becca? So proptotic edema, some subconscious hemorrhage. And we look inside there and we see this. What the heck is this? What is this thing? So when something is squeezing on the optic nerve and slowly squeezing the life out of it, you try to get the blood out of it in different ways, you get these funny shunt vessels. And then we do an MRI scan and we see, this is called the tram track sign. So you see, here's the nerve and here's this thick tissue around it. What kind of tumor is this? in the, the tissue that surrounds the nerve itself. This is a meningioma. And so gliomas arise from the astrocytes that live in the nerve. Meningiomas arise from the little meningeal cells around the nerve. But when you look at them, there's this classic path finding, this calcified, hyalinized, circular structure. This is called a somoma body with a PS, meaning there's a double M in there. That's a moma body. So this is classic for an optic nerve meningioma, the most common optic nerve tumor in adults. All right, so we're almost there. You know, you guys are about ready to go to sleep, and I'm hoping that the panic of boards is at least keeping you awake for these, so you pay attention. All right, so we just went over retinoblastoma a week ago, short-term memory. Um, Reese, how do we tell retinoblastoma from other causes of leukocoria when we've got the kid asleep? What's a simple test we could do? B scan, because it's got tons of calcium. So here we see, here's the viable tumor cells surrounding blood vessels, and then they outgrow the blood supply, they die, they undergo this secondary dystrophic calcification. That's classic. And what's the finding that we see on a differentiated retinoblastoma? What kind? Uh, Winter, the Flexner Wintersteiner. Exactly. So Flexner, Wintersteiner, and Rosettes are the most common finding that we see in a differentiated retinoblastoma. And how do they get out of the eye? Mm -hmm. Through the optic nerve. All right. And this is what happens if you don't treat them. This is a young kid from Nigeria. And these can grow explosively, and people die from these if you don't treat them. Okay, so you guys cannot be excused, <laughs> even though your brains are full. So. All right, malignant melanoma. Lee, what is the classic pattern shape that you see of a malignant melanoma the uh, yeah, Mushroom. A mushroom shape. As it breaks through Brooks membrane and spreads underneath the retina, you get a mushroom shape. What is the classification that we use to classify these? Uh, spindle A. All right, there's spindle A, then there's a spindle B, then there's a mix, then there's these cells. 
epithelioid and how and this is a mixture now spindle B epithelioid how do they spread when they spread Serial channels and where do they metastasize to? Liver. To the liver. So how do we remember that? Uh, the and the Beware the yellow <laughs> man with the glass eye. <laughs> yellow man with the glass eye. All right. Good luck on boards.